Thank you. A very warm welcome to all of you and especially our partners in this exercise, the IISS team that has come in from London and at least one person, Mark, who's come in from Washington uh, just for this. The idea was uh, to look at uh, strategic stability in the Indo-Pacific, the title that you see here, and uh, what we propose is to have, uh, I'll have Mark speak for, say, 15 to 20 minutes, is that? 15. 15, all right. <laughs> and followed by Ambassador Ponapa, and then after that, uh, we will have some comments and questions from all of you, or some of you at least who would feel sufficiently enthused. We've spent the day engaging with the IISS team on uh, similar kinds of things. And just as a way of a background, uh, let me say three short points that I thought uh, we felt that emerged. One was that when we look at what we use as shorthand, Indo-Pacific, it includes both the maritime aspect of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, but also includes the landmass, the Asian landmass, the territories that abound in these two oceans, because these territories are also being linked together in many ways, not least of which, but one of the new ones, is the One Belt, One Road initiative undertaken by China. So if we look at this entirety, or Indo-Pacific in that abbreviated form, with the kind of description that I gave you, then what we see are different kinds of conflicts. We see maritime contestations, and we also see contestations on land boundaries, disputed land boundaries. Second thing, everybody agrees that it is a time of change, and we know that the political, geopolitical center of gravity is shifting from the Euro-Atlantic to Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific or Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. But in this time of change, does stability have a place? Can stability be brought about? Are we, should we set our sights at a more modest objective of, say, a greater predictability? And if we need to do that, what kind of dialogue platforms should we have so that we can collectively develop some notion of uh, a more organized, a more stable, a more predictable way of navigating through these changing times? The third aspect because I'm standing here, so I guess you probably guessed it, is the nuclear one. Because in this time of change, particularly as the geopolitical center of gravity shifts, the nuclear dimension becomes exceedingly important. There are two reasons for it. One is that uh, we've seen that the entire uh, nuclear idiom, the entire nuclear vocabulary, of deterrence and theories about deterrence was drawn up at a period in time when there were just two players. It was as if uh, the nuclear narrative was dominated along two axes. One was, let's say, the vertical axis, which was dominated by US and USSR during the Cold War. And that vertical axis focused on bilateral arms control. So in a sense, it looked at vertical proliferation and so how best to manage it. The second axis was the horizontal axis, and once again it required a certain degree of cooperation between US and USSR to come up with multilateral agreements like the NPT, or for that matter, the London Club, which became the Nuclear Suppliers Group, because Soviet Union was a founding member of the London Club. So therefore, Again, it was dominated by US and USSR. So the paramount equation which served along both these axes was the equation of the two superpowers. 
that situation no longer holds. You've got multiple axes today. Particularly if you look at the shifting geopolitical center of gravity, you've got multiple axes. So the nuclear equation particularly is no longer dominated by either a horizontal or a vertical axis, but in fact, with a multiplicity of axes, often the lines getting blurred with much closer competition and also at a time when nuclear technology is no longer as difficult to understand. I mean, it, after all, it's a 70-year-old technology. And so therefore, it's a technology which has easily matured, and it's a technology which is much more accessible, notwithstanding the non-proliferation-related export controls that have been introduced. And so therefore, in that sense, the nuclear order as we understand it is getting frayed not because of what anything that India has done or anything that somebody else has done, but it is just a matter of reality that it's a technology which is mature and therefore more accessible. And we see that happening. And therefore, these instruments that represent the past nuclear order, as it were, how relevant are they to help us navigate or help us ensure that the nuclear taboo, which has held for all these years since 1945, continues to be observed in forthcoming years. To discuss this, we've got um, two very eminently qualified speakers, Mark Fitzpatrick, who's executive director of IISS Americas, based in Washington, and also heads their non-proliferation and nuclear policy program. He has spent many years with the US Foreign Service working on these issues, and subsequently, after his career in government, moved across to IISS. Ambassador Punapa is um, a Foreign Service officer who served both in the neighborhood and elsewhere. She has been um, India's ambassador to Thailand, to the Netherlands, to the OPCW, uh, dealing with chemical weapons. And after her career in government, she was also Deputy National Security Advisor. She has subsequently worked a lot on neighborhood. She, during her career, she was also an instructor at the National Defense College, which is one of India's premier training institutions, and has worked extensively with CSCAP, and so therefore is eminently familiar with the kind of developments that are taking place in the region, which we broadly describe as Indo-Pacific. Indo 